Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Frank DeCutter, Chair Professor of Humanities at the University of Hong Kong. He is the author of the acclaimed People's Trilogy, which documents the impact of communism on the lives of ordinary people in China. His newest book is How to Be a Dictator, The Cult of Personality in the 20th Century. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Frank. Thank you for having me. So I'd like to start with Mao. Uh, and the story, actually, of communist China. I mean, it's a big story. You've written three books on it, and uh, we've never actually talked about it much on this show. So let's get at the beginning. Um, wh where did Mao come from? Uh, where where was he actually from? Did he come from upper class, lower class, educated class? What's what's the beginning? Would it be the birth, the birth of Mao? Would it be 1921, the establishment of the Chinese Communist Party? Um, I think starting point really is 1945. Uh, that may sound a little bit glib to just, uh, you know, move straight over the 1920s and 30s and go to the end of the Second World War. But I'll do it for a reason. Um, if I if I was sitting here and you asked me, you'd ask me a question about why did Poland turn communist in 1945? Or why did Estonia turn communist in 1945? Um, well, I'm sure it'd be interesting to look at the origins of the Polish Communist Party or the Estonian Communist Party, if there is one. But the answer is pretty obvious. The Red Army invaded half of Europe. Uh, now, equally, uh, in August 1945, Stalin had a million men who marched into Manchuria, the industrial powerhouse to the north of Beijing, above the Great Wall of China, uh, and they were on their way to Korea, where they met the Americans along the 38th parallel. But they didn't leave Manchuria even after Japan surrendered. They turned over the countryside to Chairman Mao and his ragtag army of guerrilla fighters who few people uh, would have noticed otherwise. Uh, the Americans abandoned Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists uh, who were their wartime ally and imposed an arms embargo. Whereas in the meantime, Stalin uh, built up Mao Zedong's uh, party and turned them into a formidable fighting machine. Some 16 academies were established in Manchuria, military academies, inclu including aircraft, engineering, um, you name it. Uh, Chinese officers were sent to Moscow for advanced training. Uh, logistical aid arrived uh, constantly with some 2,000 wagon loads allocated to the task from North Korea alone. So by 1948, the communists were powerful enough to start attacking cities in the northern plains of Manchuria. In the case of Changchun, Lin Biao, a general under Mao's command, surrounded uh, the city uh, and blockaded it for five months. His command was turn Changchun into a city of death. In other words, make sure that these people are starved into surrender. And that is precisely what happened. Some 160,000 ordinary people were locked into Changchun, starved to death. The city fell. In its wake, other cities were unwilling to undergo the same fate. Beijing surrendered one by one like dominoes. These cities fell in October 49. The flag went up over the forbidden city in Beijing. In short, the Chinese victory was the result of a brutal war of conquest. It, taking a step back from that, though, so Stalin's, is, they're, they're coming through and they meet up with Mao and his ragtag band, as you said, but how did Mao get to there? Was he, so was he already ideologically Marxist communist at that time? How did he come to, like, why did they pick Mao on this trek and why did they enable him? In the early 1920s, after the Communist Party of China is established, membership is in, in the thousands. Uh, in, in other words, um, it is insignificant in a country that has roughly half a billion people. Uh, yet, they were spotted 
by first Lenin and then Stalin and forced into an alliance with the nationalist Chiang Kai-shek simply because they were too insignificant. But Chiang Kai-shek turned against them in 1927 and for good reason. He didn't like their methods. He thought they were brutal. This forces Mao and others to flee to the countryside. But again, Mao was stripped of his positions on several occasions by some of his uh, rivals, peers inside the Communist Party of China. But in 1935, Stalin comes to the rescue. The reason is simple. Uh, the Soviet Union is afraid of fascist Japan and again wishes to have a united front between the communists and the nationalists in China. That strategy demands that the um, status of the leader of the communist party be elevated to the same level as Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists. That's where you have the whole mythology around Mao. And Mao, of course, seizes the opportunity to promote himself. 1942-1943 are two years, not so much of fighting against the Japanese, but of purges inside the party as everyone who had ever spoken up against Mao is somehow forced to confess or otherwise uh, subject to his rule. So does that confess heresy against Marxist doctrine or Leninist doctrine or just or going up against Mao or any of the above, I guess? That's what they were confessing? So these are two, two different things. Uh, we always think in terms of Marxism-Leninism, but of course, very few of, of any of these dictators were Marxist-Leninists. Uh, Marx um, wanted a world, uh, a world um, revolution uh, carried – through by the world proletariat. Yet Stalin turned it on its head and said, no, we will have a revolution in one country only. Um, Marx predicted that it would be the proletariat to lead the revolution. Yet Mao embraced the peasants instead. Why did he do so? Because in China at the time, 0.5% of the population were workers, uh, 80% were villagers. He did so out of sheer pragmatic concern. So forget about loyalty to a creed. It is loyalty to a person that mattered most whether it is in the case of Stalin, in the case of Mao or other dictators uh, for that matter. So what I'm trying to say here is that Mao used the opportunity to purge those who didn't show sufficient loyalty to him as a person. So does this mean Mao wasn't a true believer? There are – either you are a dictator or you are a true believer. Mm -hmm. These are mutually incompatible. If you take the case of Kim Il-sung, North Korea imposed on an unwilling population in 1945 by the Russian, Russians, um, he moves by 1968 against all books that appear to be foreign, including those written by Marx and Engels. And 1972 has Marxism written out of the constitution, replaced by Kim Il-sung thought. So to put it simply, one is never a Marxist-Leninist in any one of these regimes. One is a Stalinist under Stalin, a Maoist under Mao, a Kim Il-sungist under Kim Il-sung. It would be a dangerous thing to read Marx at the height of the Cultural Revolution in China. That that your in your people's trilogy it, it in three parts. Um, it do you do you see it? Is it is it really cleanly kind of divided this post post communist revolution China into three? I mean, nothing is clean in history, but no. But but you. But you no, have, I didn't sit out to write the trilogy. I just started off by f trying to get as much material from the archives as possible and something interesting, and. Um, the Great Leap Forward really uh, stood out. There was so much material um, on this famine from 1958 to 62 that I dug in and, and discovered, of course, sheer horror with tens of millions of people beaten, starved, worked literally to death during that period, uh, a, a huge crime against humanity. And only then did I think that um, I should return to the archives and look at the earlier years, hence the tragedy of liberation, where I um, narrate what happened during the Second World War, but most importantly, after 1949, years that are sometimes still seen as a sort of golden age, but which 
in effect, was a, a pretty ruthless elimination of all organizations outside of the organization of the Communist Party of China, where by 1956, uh, private property has been confiscated. Entrepreneurs have had to give the property to the state. Farmers no longer have the land, and they are used as bonded servants of the state. And then only at the very end that my mother actually tell me I wanted to hear and read about what happened after the Great Leap Forward, <laughs> namely the Cultural Revolution. So I started doing that one at the very end. Which um, is its own form of crazy, but a different type. Yes, yeah. of course they all overlap. Yes, yeah. These archives, these are the Communist Party's archives? Yeah. that you're. So what's the process like of getting access to – I mean you're going into you, – you're not going into this to write a book that is going to be overwhelmingly positive of the communist revolution. Well, I would so, have had I found, you know, had such, I found had evidence. evidence, such evidence. evidence. Okay, yes. but it was unlikely. Uh, what's the process like of getting access to that? And were they, with the communist party, were they skeptical of? Granting you access well, to there it? Are, there are many party archives. They exist at the central level in Beijing for, say, a ministry, the provincial archives that belong to the provincial party committee. Um, the Communist Party is basically a, a, a very sophisticated hierarchy. And at every level, there is an archive. It could be a neighborhood archive. It could be a city archive. So literally, you know, just dozens and dozens of them. Um, all you need to do is turn up with a letter of reference. Uh, uh, what is astounding is not so much that I did it. What is astounding is that so few other people do it, except oddly enough, until recently, um, historians of the POC inside the People's Republic of China, but very few Europeans and Americans. It's a language barrier, if nothing else. No, it's not a language barrier. If you go to Moscow, you have to get your seat. Um, uh, you have to turn up very early in any of those archives because there are plenty of, you know, eager German PhD students and Americans who, who, who are busy researching the Soviet Union, but not some of the People's Republic of China. And unfortunately, um, there is a predominant tendency towards uh, towards what I call armchair sinology. So I, I, this is a dumb question. I'm sure I know the answer to it, but I am. I imagine your books are not available in China. Indeed. Uh, and maybe that's one reason why they let you go in because they, knew uh, they, were, so they weren't going to let you write about <laughs> yes. this in China. Yes. Well, you, you can't <laughs> Google me in China because, of course, there is no Google. But if you use the local equivalent, Baidu, then, of course, my name means nothing. Thank you very much. Now, the the Great Famine, um, I mean, it's it, you, you're really – Talking about getting into the numbers of you know who killed more and all these things, which are some of the you know distasteful conversations about twentieth century dictators. But uh, we have I have some idea, a better idea of, of Stalin's U Ukraine Great Famine and kind of what the point was for the collectivization of the farms. Was this the same? Very much thing so. happening. Yeah. Um, a question some of my students have is why do they do what they did when they know that it will go pear shaped? Uh, Stalin did it with the Ukraine and other parts of the Soviet Union, 29 to 33, roughly 34. Um, Mao did it. Pol Pot will do it later on. And, of course, you have roughly the same in Northern Korea. But the whole point is that Mao, his allies, they know perfectly well what happened under Stalin. But I don't think this is a bad thing. What you want in a one-party state is have the grain from the fields move straight into the state granaries, the coffers, so to speak, and then sell it uh, abroad to earn the foreign currency with which you can buy the equipment needed to fuel modernization, industrial plants. That's what Stalin did. That's what Mao did. What Mao sees in Stalin is a man who managed to, tra to tr manage to transform um, a backward Russian empire into a major world power capable of defeating Adolf Hitler and the Nazis and occupying half of Europe. Well, who, 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 who That's would a great want country. to do the same yes, thing? Yes, yes. <laughs> so how many people total died? Well, well I, I don't come up with a number. I, I say at least 45 million, which, by the way, is a figure that has been used by at least three other people who have used um, Communist Party archives. Um, but it's disputed by everyone who has never set a foot in the archive. Okay. But so they've seen they've seen this play out in other places and have seen that it leads to a lot of deaths. And so they can they're aware. I mean, maybe they're not aware that it's going to be forty five million, but they're aware that it's going to be a lot. 
is that does that factor into the thinking at all? I mean, even if you think like you're like, well, it would be great if we made our country industrial. Like you told me, like, well, we can we can change America and we make it a whole lot better. Um, but oh yeah, there's going to be millions of deaths. You'd think most people would be like, well, but maybe we should slow down there. Well, I don't think they predicted there would be any deaths. Um, they wouldn't have liked that to happen, uh, except in a few cases where the people who are starved to death are considered to be politically unreliable, uh, if if not enemies of the people. Why would you feed them? Um, so the key, the key point really is that it's the military model that is attractive. The idea is that you will transform every man, every woman in the countryside into a foot soldier in one giant army that you can de deploy day and night to transform the economy and somehow catapult that country forward past the Soviet Union, the real rival, uh, of course. But the result is that when you start approaching people in a military way, when you put them in collective canteens and collective dormitories, when you separate, separate out children and send them to collective kindergartens, um, every incentive to work is lost when people no longer have tools or utensils, pots, pans, never mind the land or control over their own schedule. They truly are bonded servants of, of the state. And the local officials uh, referred to as carders, sometimes pronounced as cadres by Americans, the local carders have to whip up the workforce in one drive after the other. And so that's the point where they clash. Well, then, so how do you, you being the people instituting these policies react when the deaths start piling up and you start getting to that 45 million. And I guess a, a sub-question to that is how aware were they of the 45 million? China is a big place. Well, they not. didn't have the like communication technologies. No. So there's two different things. It's one thing to say, oh, Mao and the others weren't aware of it. And it's another thing to say uh, they didn't know it was 45 million or at least 45 million as I claim. Um, they were – well aware all along that there were major mishaps and that there were major, major issues with uh, forcibly collectivizing people uh, the way they did and herding them into what were referred to as people's communes. But the point is all of them were military men. Now, what kind of war will you wage if you start crying uh, every time you lose a battle? I mean, Remember, Stalin means steel. Molotov it means hammer. You must push through. You must have an iron will to go through with this. It is the bourgeoisie that spends time crying over loss of life. And that's exactly what they do. They push through till, of course, the inevitable happens. Uh, round about 1961, the scale of destruction, not just of human beings, but of, of buildings, of infrastructure, uh, where everything is traded, uh, cannibalized, so to speak. Um, the, the scale of destruction is, is such, uh, by one estimate, by number two, Liu Shaoqi, some 60% of all housing in uh, Mao's native province of Hunan has been destroyed. Uh, the, the scale is such that the party has to step back. And then, so the great, great leap forward, uh, I'm trying to get my timeline correct here. Does that come after the famine or is that part of the famine? The famine is part of the great leap forward? Well, it's one and the same thing. One and the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are those who say great leap forward was a political campaign and the famine came later. But the moment you start collectivizing people in the summer of 58, the deaths uh, appear. And then we have I mean, the key point about the Great Leap Forward is, is really, I mean, Lee Ray, Mao's secretary, put it. He passed away uh, earlier this year. A wonderful man. I think he lived to, to the age of a hundred. He, he said it in a review of Mao's Great Firm in my book. He said the, the core reason of all this is because human beings didn't treat other human beings like human beings. They were treated just like cattle. Cattle. Yeah. And then we have the Cultural Revolution, which I've heard in some senses the party at least and maybe Mao himself was – they were a little bit – they believed that there were failures that were involved with the Great Leap Forward and those failures were I guess related to cultural – inconsistencies or, or heretics or of some sort? It's it really quite straightforward. 1934, Congress of Victors, a number of people are disgruntled with collectivization and death in the Ukraine. They secretly vote against Stalin. What happens over the following years? A great terror. Some 1.5 million people are arrested, tortured, interrogated, the vast majority of them shot. Um, what happens in 1962? Some 7,000 cars convene in Beijing. 
discuss the Great Leap Forward and the disaster that happened. And Mao's star is uh, no longer shining all that brightly. He is afraid that he will meet the same fate as Stalin, who was, of course, denounced by Khrushchev in 56. Um, so same thing. He starts, Mao starts planning uh, something equivalent to the Great Terror, and it will appear a few years later, starting in 1966, as the Cultural Revolution. The idea is that there are still bourgeois, superstitious, feudal ideas, culture, that must be destroyed and replaced by pure proletarian culture. But of course, underneath, Mao uses the campaign to um, unleash Red Guards against anyone at any level of the hierarchy who has ever expressed any doubt about his leadership. Millions of lives are trampled. Mao, at the end of his life, feels reasonably secure. And uh, he also tries to reify his position or at least because the, the Little Red Book is is really coming around that time, the Cultural Revolution in the Little Red Book. I don't know if it existed before, but pushing it. Yes. But of course, all dictators have the equivalent. Uh, Stalin had his, uh, you know, hand, hand book. Uh, Mao had one, Kim Il-sung. In fact, even Mengistu in Ethiopia um, had an informal sort of little manual with quotations from Chairman Mengistu because everybody knew that you must demonstrate loyalty to the chairman, whoever he may be, by learning his writings, committing his learnings, uh, his, his writings um, to, to memory as a token of your loyalty, but also because you do not wish to be denounced by anyone else. What what kind of writings were in the Little Red Book? Like, what does its contents look like? Well, you know, you can talk about Mao as a philosopher or Stalin as a philosopher or Duvalier as a ph philosopher. You know, there is, there is a body of work called Duvalierism. But ultimately, none of these dictators are philosophers. What they really seek is an ism that can be attached to their name um, and, and have people learn it by heart um, in order to betoken their loyalty to them. You have to bear in mind, uh, we've, we've talked so much from the moment I went to university, you know, so much talk about ideology and how important this is. But for any dictator, what they want is loyalty to their person, not loyalty to a creed. Ideology is divisive. I mean, look at the Bolsheviks and Lenin. They seized power in 1917. Their enemies are the Mensheviks. But both, of course, get their inspiration straight from Marx. Dictators don't really like ideology all that much. <laughs> now, the, the other thing that you always hear about with the Cultural Revolution is well, the students, the involvement of the students in the, in the universities to some extent. I mean, do you have any sort of like, I don't want to say favorite because it's, it's such a horrific time, but in terms of the kind of purges that were going on either of – you know, artifacts, uh, uh, different cultural items of various sorts. Well, of course, you know, any sign of the past becomes suspect. If you have an old photograph album, that's suspect. If you play piano, that's suspect. If you read a foreign novel, that's suspect. Uh, if you had any link with any foreigner before 1949, that's suspect too. So in Shanghai alone, in the summer of 1966, Red Guards carry out some uh, house raids uh, in, in about a, a quarter of a million homes, either confiscating or, or burning any any trace of the past, whether these are ordinary books or you know rare bronzes and scrolls. What about in anything Western too? Or in, they... in, well, in Western by definition means capitalist. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, that would be the piano, yes, but not the not the Chinese instruments. Yes, yeah, several hundreds of pianos are confiscated. And then at, at least in this particular case, the news is quite good. They're redistributed to schools as opposed to ending up on a bonfire. But uh, very large bonfires, libraries are raided and books are burnt. What's – so that's the destruction of the, the artifacts, the objects and whatnot. But the people who get caught up in this, like you, you know, there's reason – they have reason to believe that you're suspect in some way. What happens to you? Um, by the – End of the month of September 1966 in Beijing alone, some 1,700 people have been literally uh, beaten to death, killed, a few electrocuted or um, you know, set on fire. There are several cases of people being buried alive outside uh, Beijing in the suburbs. Um, in other words, enemies of the people um, are, are hounded out of the cities uh, or, or, or liquidated 
otherwise. But what is so fascinating, of course, and this is the true goal of the Cultural Revolution, is that Red Guards soon enough start fighting each other. Uh, and then Mao appeals to the people at large, including the workers, to go and help the Red Guards carry through the Cultural Revolution. But the workers become divided. And then in February 1967, he asks the army to come in and support the true proletarian left. And the army is divided, too, about the true intentions of and voice of Chairman Mao. So by 1967-68, people are fighting each other in the streets with uh, anti-aircraft artillery, uh, all of them convinced that they represent the true voice of Chairman Mao. It seems like chaos, but Mao relishes it because he's in control of the entire game. Uh, he feeds a cycle of violence in which people has to have to constantly prove their loyalty to him and him alone. So in the end, it produces a very atomized society in which links between uh, you know, family members, neighbors, colleagues are, are broken up. And so is it is this the cultural revolution so Mao I think dies in seventy six, as I've heard. Seventy yep. six. Does the cultural revolution end before he dies or just does it just sort of continue until until his death? Oh, the different ways different ways of looking at it, the purist who will tell you that sixty six, sixty nine is the cultural revolution, uh and what follows is is the aftermath. But all of it really is the cultural revolution. But I would say there is a big difference in nineteen seventy one the army is purged in turn. With the death of Lin Biao, the man who in a uh, plane crash, I think, correct? In a plane crash, which was he murdered? Of course, is okay. arranged. Of okay. course, is arranged crash. Uh, although I don't say that in the book because I don't have the evidence. So. Obviously, it's done on purpose. The very man who starved Chang Chun to death in 1948 brings an end to um, the, the rule of the army, which in the meantime has turned China into literally a military garrison. Uh, but then something very interesting happens from 1971 onwards. Ordinary people in the countryside realize um, that the credibility of communism have been, has been destroyed in you know, the Great Leap Forward, 5862, but the organization of the party has been undermined by the Cultural Revolution. In other words, there are no longer enough cadres who have sufficient faith to force farmers to stay within these collectives called people's communes. So, so very gradually, in what I call a silent revolution, ordinary people in the country start, start setting up uh, black markets. They open underground factories. They claim back their land. They redistribute the tools among themselves. They wrench away from the state some very basic economic freedoms. Just, just because the state didn't have the attention or the manpower to stop them? The, the party doesn't have it anymore. The party has been weakened, if not largely destroyed. Uh, In those areas. By Chairman Mao. By Chairman Mao. Yeah. Yes. So when so on his death, uh, we we have a I mean there's usually some sort of power jostling of course that happens upon any dictator's death, um, and we do see a pretty transforming China coming out of the 70s with with Mao's death. But is there is there's never there's never a disavowal of him. No, not in the same way as no, of course he picked the right man, Deng Xiaoping. He, Deng Xiaoping. He, he, Mao was obsessed with what happened to Stalin namely de-Stalinization, and they made sure it wouldn't happen with him by picking Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping is occasionally described as the man who started economic reform. But as I um, alluded to earlier on, the true architect of economic reform is really the people. The individual people. It's the people managed to wrench away basic economic freedoms. Deng Xiaoping was smart enough to realize that he could use economic growth to rebuild the party and use a rebuilt party to ruthlessly crush the political aspirations of ordinary people, which he did again and again and again with notes, of course, on June the 4th, 1989, when the tanks move into Tiananmen Square. Yeah. But, but is it fair to say we have growth in China? So, I mean, we, the poverty level is changing a lot from the 70s onward. Well, it couldn't be any more poor, could it? I guess. The party but, says that it pulled hundreds of millions of people from poverty, but it didn't. It dispossessed them. It beat them. It stripped them of their most basic fundamental freedoms. And it's ultimately the people who lifted themselves out of poverty uh, from roughly 1970 uh, onwards. 
Um, although it is true that Deng had the wisdom to not stand in the way from 1979 onwards. Because you have the, I mean, the China of 1990 looks very different than the China of 1970. Yes, indeed. In terms of what you just walk down the streets of Shanghai, I think you'd see more yes. well, lights it, it in the industry be more businesses. Abysmal. It couldn't be more abysmal. In so, 1970, yes. yes. Yeah. But by 19, even when Mao dies, living standards of ordinary people are lower than what they were in 1949. So that's what we're talking about. Just getting back to the level of 1949 and then somehow catching up with the rest of planet Earth. If you look at the gross domestic product per capita, and China uh, in 1979 um, is not an awful lot worse off than in, say, 1989 or 1999. It is roughly below Turkestan and Zimbabwe at the end of the 20th century. What? How much of this this story that you've just been telling are ordinary Chinese today aware of? Um, and, and what's their view of the Communist Party given the, the horrors that it inflicted on China well, over the 20th century? Well, it's a huge population that we don't know what they think because they haven't been granted the freedom to say what they think. In fact, they've never been encouraged to look back at the past. So I've no doubt that many of them know perfectly well what happened. Uh, among their own family members uh, or in their own village. Um, but none of them have been encouraged to do so. It's very difficult to know what people think in a dictatorship. And the first casualty of a dictatorship is freedom of speech. And that's no different in China today. My feeling is that there must be an extremely broad spectrum of ideas about the past from those who embrace the party and profit from it um, to, to, to those who, um, you know, detest it very thoroughly. But we don't know. How would you? In your experience talking to Chinese, so this is, I mean, so Tiananmen Square is a great example where if you you can't Google as you pointed out, but if you if you Google Tiananmen Square in China, you're going to get nothing. Um, but do you think that most people know that it happened? I mean, there's no way of knowing. Is partially, I guess, I don't trust. You this. don't want to speak out. I, I know there is a journalist who went on the street and asked people, you know, what do you think of Tiananmen Square, and then people pretend that they don't know. There's one thing you must realize in a dictatorship, whether this is under Adolf Hitler or Stalin or Duvalier um, or, or Mao or Xi Jinping today, people are great actors. They know how to chant the slogans. They know how to extol their leader. They know how to cry on command or denounce with proletarian anger every enemy on command. They are great actors. They have to do so. So when some foreign journalist with a camera asks somebody in Beijing what they think of Tiananmen Square and the person says, oh, I don't really know, one shouldn't really be too surprised. It's a dumb methodology. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> how, how unfree – is daily life in China now? So, I mean, yeah, the people are kind of keeping whatever knowledge they have of Tiananmen Square on the down low and so on. But like the day-to-day -day life, how much does it feel like this oppressive well, dictatorship? Well, it depends on who you are. It depends where you are. If you're a party member, you'd be rather content with your lot. If you're a city dweller, and chances are you profit from, from – uh, from the wealth accumulated by the party, you're probably quite happy too. I very much doubt that there will be an uprising tomorrow morning in Beijing, Shanghai or Wuhan. On the other hand, if you go to the countryside, now well, every basic freedom is, is missing. Fundamentally, although you can move, you do not really have the freedom to go to a city and open a lemonade stand as you could do in India or anywhere else. Um, not only that, but of course, it remains to this day a caste system or an apartheid system where people classified as peasants uh, don't have the same uh, legal, social, economic benefits as those who are classified as city dwellers. So that's the line that the two lines that run through China. One is party members and those outside of the party. And then there is one between uh, city dwellers and those classified as peasants, quote unquote. Then how do you react to among, among a certain set of American intellectuals right now um, not, not. I'm not talking about like kind of communist intellectuals and whatnot, but just like more mainstream. There's a there's a romanticization of China as a place where the government can get things done. Where like you know we in America like we haven't solved green energy because we just don't have the will, but over in China they can do it because they know how to like get together and do things. Yeah, isn't Italy wonderful? Trains run on time, run on time under <laughs> Mussolini. Yes. Um, well, if that's what you want, go ahead, you know, and um, transform 
uh, get rid of your checks and balances, abolish your judicial independence, which is a safeguard for your private property, uh, destroy the political institutions you have, uh, start stripping away your civil society, close down every organization outside of the one organization you think will accomplish the task. And good luck with that. Uh, there's no such thing as some Chinese miracle here. When a one-party state uh, like China has access to the deposits of 1.4 billion uh, of its subjects, it can do a great number of things. It can build new airports, new highways, uh, bullet trains, you name it. Large, empty apartment buildings. And a great number of skyscrapers that mm -hmm. are completely empty. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's such a bizarre airports that are empty, really, like the one in Wuhan, which I use roughly once a month, both international and domestic terminals. Empty, a mile to the left, a mile to the right. Who needs it? Why are they building empty stuff? Well, why wouldn't you? If you are a local uh, cadre, if you are in charge of an entire province, or in charge of a city, or in charge of a neighborhood, you must produce. A quota of growth. Here in the United States and elsewhere in Europe, Japan, uh, gross domestic product is something that you must calculate. Econ 101 tells you there are three different ways of calculating it. I will not summarize it. But in the People's Republic of China, it is a quota. You must achieve 6.5% of growth. So what do you do if you're mayor of a city? Well, you just have more of your local factories produce cement. If you have to dig a hole and pour the concrete into a hole, it doesn't really matter. Uh, what matters is that you can prove you achieved 6.5%. If what you build stands anti, it doesn't matter either. China, I think, is confusing to a lot of people because we've had tourism open up in a way that it wasn't true, of course, in 1970, before the opening of China. But they go to places like Shanghai. Um, Hong Kong, which of course has its own history, and we can get a little bit of what's happening there. But, but these 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 vast, you know, very very well lit, seemingly technologically advanced. The future is now. I've seen the future, and it works. Kind of thing. You say people say these people are oppressed. I mean, this is this is the most capitalist place I've seen on on the planet. Uh, what's going on? In well, a place that's like a Shanghai? misunderstanding of the term capitalism. I mean, capitalism is based on private property. It's based on markets. It's based on trade. But how can you trade something if there's no protection of your private property? You can be a billionaire and vanish. And all of a sudden, all of your property now belongs to the state. Thank you very much. So this happens on a regular basis. Um, so it's not capitalism. A state corporatism where state-owned enterprises uh, are dominant. The land belongs to the state. The banks belong to the state. Industry belongs to the state. Most enterprises are directly or indirectly controlled by the state. The state is the party. Wealth flows to the party. The party decides how this wealth should be used. It's obviously used to build up uh, places that will attract more foreign investment so that they can paper over all those black holes that they've created with their command economy. Uh, from 1979 onwards, foreign trade, the currency earned on the international market has been used to keep afloat the rest of the sector, which remains dominated by an old-fashioned state model. Um, that's what you have to bear in mind. So yes, Shanghai looks good, uh, and parts of Beijing look very good indeed. Uh, but that's what you do when you play SimCity. Does this mean then that we can expect to see the Chinese economy collapse at some point? Or is like all of this papering over going to stop working? You can paper over issues uh, in an open, accountable, democratic system for a little bit of time. If you have a one-party state, you can do it for a much longer time. But of course, these problems just accumulate and become bigger and bigger and bigger. They were huge in 79, bigger by 1988, very large by 99. But the key point really is 2008 with the uh, international crisis when the people in Beijing look around the world and think that they have arrived. This is the collapse of capitalism. This is the moment where they will prevail and they start printing money like there's no tomorrow. All those skyscrapers, all those airports, bullet trains, a lot of it 
uh, dates from the last 10, 11 years. So the debt is enormous. And so we now have other types of – that's the thing that I think has been noticed in the last 10 years is – we keep well, at least in my paying what I'm paying attention to. I keep hearing about new forms of oppression that weren't in China. I think maybe in 2000, uh, whether it's uh, the social tracking system that's coming up and more dictatorial type of things coming down from the top. Well, uh, indeed, you asked me earlier on. You know, do people are they ready to to rebel? I said, well, probably not if you live in a city, but if you go all the way to Xinjiang or if you're in Tibet. Uh, yeah, cameras everywhere. Yes, large camps. Yes, people sent to camps for next to nothing. Uyghur camps. Wearing a beard yeah. is yeah. enough to get you uh, convicted and sent off to a camp. Um, so clearly, this is um, an empire. Uh, don't forget the Bolsheviks inherited the Tsarist Empire. Mao Zedong inherited uh, the Qing Empire, the boundaries of the empire uh, that were there in place uh, as it collapsed in 1911. And so it is still an empire. And of course, Beijing is very worried about the borderlands, very worried from Hong Kong to Xinjiang, Tibet uh, and elsewhere. And that's what's happening just in now in, in Hong Kong. Uh, and I, I don't see how Hong Kong can resist. I mean, overall, it, 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 it's such a strange history in its own little place where we have this liberal place that was given to a very illiberal country. And I don't think that – I think one of those is going to have to give well, and yes, it's probably not going to be exactly. China. It's referred to as one country, two systems, namely that Hong Kongers were allowed after the handover in 1997 to preserve their own unique system, including the freedoms they had. And a promise was made that the chief executive – uh, would be allowed to be elected by universal suffrage at a certain point in time. Uh, now, when you say one party, two systems, and um, the one the one system has 1.4 billion people and the other one has 8 million, it doesn't strike me as exactly very balanced, besides the fact that you shouldn't really trust anything a one-party state says or signs, as Hong Kongers have found out. Namely, that all these promises uh, have been broken again and again and again. So maybe w w with this story that we've gone through and, and uh, still we had a brutal, particularly brutal dictator in Mao and we had other dictators throughout and we have what you call – is it it's Xi Jinping? Is that how you say it? Mm. I'm, bad, I'm bad at this. Xi Jinping, yeah. yes. It, would, would you call him a dictator? In well, of course. Case? I mean – why would you not tell me? I agree. I, I'm just. I'm just. Qual I would. I would call. I mean, is, is too, there a plurality? Is is there separation of powers at every at, at any one level? I don't think there is. I mean, what would you call a country that does not have an independent judicial system, uh, that does not have protection of uh, private property, that claims in the constitution that socialist property is sacred, um, that does not have um, separation of powers? Um, et cetera, et cetera. Individual rights. Yes. yes. Well, I would call it um, a dictatorship. I call it that a dictatorship. So then, how does this play out in Hong Kong? Like, what is? Well, it's a clash of systems, isn't it? Right. So, what's the end game, or what? What can we expect to see? Is, is China just going to come in and crush this well, I rebellion? Don't know. Will the rebellion peter out? How would I be tell you? How would I be able to tell you what will happen in future? I'm well, a historian. <laughs> look at the past. I, well, Santayana, no. they probably don't even know in Beijing what they're going to do. They're probably running around, you know, just scurrying around trying to come up with a solution, but they can't because they're trapped because of one party dictatorship it is always um, limited um, by a very short playbook. There's, there aren't, if, if repression is your only response to political aspirations of, of people, then there's not an awful lot you can do. Well, then what's stopping them from just doing that? Well, the comparisons with 1989 are, are, are not very good. In 1989, uh, it wasn't just people in Beijing, a million of them, but it was people in literally dozens and dozens and dozens of other cities um, who were up in arms and demanded reform, political reform. So the very life 
of the party was threatened. Now, Hong Kong is no threat to the life of the party. Moreover, Hong Kong is a massive place uh, for investment uh, into China and investment out of China. Um, I told you earlier on there's no such thing as an independent judicial system, never mind rule of law, which means that the vast majority of very big companies in China want to have a seat in Hong Kong. In fact, every Communist Party member who has acquired some wealth will want to place it outside of the People's Republic of China, preferably first in Hong Kong, and, and, and then London, Vancouver, Washington, you name it. So, so Hong for, Kong remains absolutely vital. So going over this story and uh, and then looking at the, their newest book, which is not out yet. It will be coming out in December. Uh, and it's about more than just China. You talk about, you know, Kim Il-sung and some others too. But so what in this story, what have we learned or about in maybe way of summary how to be a dictator? Well, how to be a dictator is one title. The subtitle is The Cult of Personality. So these are two things. Um, and the reason I focus on the cult of personality is because I think that ultimately dictators have two main instruments. And one is fear and terror. The other one really is image or what I call the glorification uh, of a dictator. And I think we've uh, we've tended to overlook that cult of personality or see it as a sort of marginal aberrant phenomenon when in fact it is absolutely at the heart of a dictatorship. A dictatorship really is power seized through violence, and power seized through violence must be maintained through violence. But violence is a very, very blunt instrument. You can't go on this purging and killing and repressing. So it is much better if a dictator can somehow compel ordinary people to acclaim him in public. And this is particularly true for his entourage, the very people around him, since he sees power power, um, it raises the prospect of a stab in the back. Somebody else could do the same thing to him. So how do you prevent your potential rivals uh, from moving against you? Well, you force them, your allies and your rivals alike, to acclaim you in public, uh, in front of all the others. And by doing so, you gradually transform the people around you into liars. And when everybody lies, nobody knows who thinks what. So it becomes very difficult to form an alliance and organize a coup. Um, of course, that's what dictators are truly obsessed about, is maintain their power and extend it uh, to avoid the very fate they inflicted on others. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, you can find our Free Thoughts discussion group on Facebook or on Reddit at r slash Free Thoughts Podcast. You can follow us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. As always, please rate and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible and Landry Ayers. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.